Hello, I'm Matt. Um, I recently uh, completed my PhD looking at the deliberate destruction of Bronze Age metalwork in southwest England. Yay. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit around, around the process for my thesis, some of the collaborations that developed um, through it and how they shaped some of my results and conclusions. Um, if anyone wants to get in contact with me to complain or praise me, um, there is Twitter and there is email or come speak to me at the end. So to give you uh, a little bit of background, this is the um, area I was studying, Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, Dorset. There's around 3,000 pieces of Bronze Age metalwork from this area. And I approached this topic wanting to understand the why behind some of the depositional practices. Uh, in particular, why do we find so much fragmented, broken, damaged uh, metalwork deposited in this period? Uh, we see bent and broken swords, we see fragmented axes, crushed spearheads. And um, as I began the research for this project, it became very clear that you can fall into one of two camps. You can either believe that everything is functional and was intended for recycling and scrapping and these objects that just wore out over time, or you can go full on ritual and you bend and break your best spear and you throw it in a river and you uh, do the same with swords because these are offerings to the gods or symbolic of having killed your enemies so you kill their weapons. Um, however, when I uh, started to go around museums and approach the data set, I was frequently asked, well, how do you know if it's been deliberately destroyed or just accidentally destroyed or accidentally broken? Um, and I realized I had absolutely no idea. Nowhere in the wealth of academic literature could tell me except uh, there were various suppositions that said Oh yes, uh, a sword will break if you bend and snap it over your knee. Um, axes are very hard to break. Um, but of course this doesn't match up with the archaeological data uh, where in southwest England there's in the region of about seven or eight hundred broken axes, which is quite a lot for an object that doesn't break very well. So I completely changed tack and I thought, how do I tackle the how? And if we can understand how these objects have been broken, what can that then start to tell us about why they're being broken? Who must have been involved in these processes in order to, to do this in the past? Did you need metalworking uh, knowledge? Did you need um, certain equipment, certain skills? Or could any old idiot with a hammer do it? Um, me being the idiot in this scenario. So I was very fortunate to uh, Travelled to Italy on a fairly um, impromptu trip that my supervisor said, oh yes, I have contacts at this experimental park in Italy, you should go. Um, and I went with the intention of learning how to make bronze objects. And whilst I was there, I asked them, I asked the metal workers, how would you break up a sword? And they looked at me fairly blankly and, and said, well, what, what do you mean? I said, well, exactly that, how do you break up a sword? He said, oh, we do it every day. We, um, we cast swords for the public, uh, it's a 20 minute show, it's very entertaining. They hold up this freshly uh, cast sword, the public disappear, they put it back in the fire, smack, 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 it goes into lost pieces, they throw it in the cru crucible and they cast a new one for the next, um, the next set of uh, public members. So immediately I had an answer to this question that not a single Bronze Age academic could tell me. Um, but these people who worked with this material on a daily basis inherently understood this material um, in a way that I could probably never quite get my head around. When I asked them what temperature does the fire need to be at, what is the best tool for this, what, you know, the kind of quantifiable pieces that I wanted to understand, they spoke to me purely in terms of experiential knowledge. You know, they know how when a sword is ready to be fragmented because it's red and glowing in the fire. They talk of being able to smell when it's hot enough. Um, they know that they know inherently that the material will behave in a certain way under these circumstances, but they couldn't tell me why it was behaving in that way. And this led me on a, um, on a train of thought that 
encouraged me to come home and find my own metal worker to discuss this with. And I was very fortunate to, um, to meet Neil Bowich, who is a metal worker based down in Cornwall, so very close to where I was doing my research anyway. If you've ever held a replica bronze sword, chances are it's probably one of his. He's been doing this for the better part of about 20 years. He has an interest in archaeology, but none of the theoretical stuff. He's purely interested in how do they make these things and and what what that meant to the metal worker in, in prehistory. Um, I was uh, fortunate fortunate enough to get some funding to cast some replicas of my own. These are all based on uh, examples that I saw in museums and there, there was a really nice collaboration here between the local museums and me and um, Neil visiting them to look at these artefacts, to discuss through them, to talk about how you get from a broken fragment into a fully complete object like a sword or an axe or a spear. Um, and working with a craftsperson, he saw things in this material that I, would, I had never been able to spot, um, even after several years of, of looking at Bronze Age metalwork. Um, he can see hammer marks, he can see casting floors. Um, it, I'm still learning how to see this stuff, but for him it's just glaringly obvious. And it, it was a really interesting collaborative process to be part of. Um, so, I, having got the funding to do the replicas, I went back to a very basic question, which is, what is the best way to break objects? Um, I already knew that there's a, I already had a starting point for this. I knew that if you put the metal into, the, into a fire, heated it up to a certain temperature, as indicated by color, um, it would become very brittle and break. And so I tried to, I tried to, whittle this down to four kind of key points that I wanted to explore a little bit further. What is the impact of heating this stuff versus unheating? Uh, would, di would different tools have different effects? Are there Im is there an impact in different forms of objects? Would an axe break differently to a sword, for instance? Uh, what was the effect of metal composition? I'm not going to go into all of the results of this uh, today. Instead, I'm going to show you a video of me hitting things. <laughs> Um, so, what you see here is we've got this sword, we've heated it up to a, around five or six hundred degrees, as estimated by Neil. Um, it then comes out in a very brittle state, and here's me failing with a hammer and chisel to uh, fragment this cleanly. And it became clear that actually the chisel was completely redundant, and instead, if you just hit it, it will, uh, it will just go to pieces. And if you heat up an object too much, it becomes um, into a very heightened, brittle state and will um, explode on impact. Um, so, uh, on a side note, that is a fantastic way to relieve PhD stress. <laughs> um, I don't have a video of me hitting things uh, whilst they're unheated because it turned out that that was a very ineffective way of doing things. Uh, that axe head took three, three hits to break when heated. I hit uh, the same axe head or another replica unheated 105 times and didn't break it. Um, and the wear, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a blacksmith, I'm not a metal worker, you can probably see that. Um, but the wear on my hand, my wrist, my arm, it was. Um, after hammering metal for 105 blows it, and it not proving fruitful, I just terminated the experiment then and there. Um, but oh, this, these were in case my video didn't work, um, but it did. Sorry. These, this is uh, the result of these experiments. And anyone who's ever looked at Bronze Age fragments should be able to see that these are uh, very closely comparable to what's coming up through the Portable Antiquities Scheme on an almost daily basis as well as the vast number of hordes that have been historically found. Um, when um, I was really pleased when, to have these results and to be able to compare them to the archaeological record, what we've got here is, um, in the top, top left, is a sword from St. Earth in Cornwall, and on the bottom right, a fragment of a spearhead from the Bloody Pool Horde in Devon, which I'll come back to in a minute, and as well as this, um, the the fragmented axe heads could be quite closely compared as well. 
And all of this uh, starts to build towards a reference collection for understanding this material better in the past. But throughout, the, throughout this process, there was uh, something more that could be developed, I felt, which was that in, I, what needed to be done was implementing the, the, meta, the metalworking knowledge into this process as well. So thinking about not just why was this stuff um, being broken or, or even um, even how was it being done. These, these fragments that we see at the bottom here were almost certainly done when heated. Um, and the heat that we worked at was about five or six hundred degrees, but there's, and, and that was based on the metal working knowledge that Neil had as well as aspects of colour. And it's a completely different way of thinking about this material other than an isolated fragment found in a field by a metal detector that has no context and no further information. Um, it led me towards thinking about destruction more as a performance. The, these are um, fragmented, um, fragmented spearheads that were found in a very evocatively titled bog called the Bloody Pool in uh, Devon. Uh, legend has it that these are Viking spears that were sacrificed by Viking raiders in South Devon. Um, I'm not sure where this myth came from, but there you go. Uh, the, the understanding has generally been that these spearheads were deliberately broken. My experiments have confirmed not only that they were deliberately broken, but also some of the activities that must have led up to this. So there must have at some point been a collection of these objects. They mu there must have been the construction of a fire. Um, five or six hundred degrees for a fire is not particularly hot if you know how to make a fire. Uh, cremation pies, for instance, get up to about a thousand degrees without any need for specialist metalworking equipment like bellows and triers and um, and other aspects like this. So you needed a good working knowledge of making a fire. You needed the objects. You needed to put them in the fire, and then the the microstructure of bronze becomes so brittle at this heat and at this heated state that it, Pretty much anything will break it. I, sh I showed you a video there of me hitting it with a bronze hammer, but I've also done this with uh, antler hammers, stone hammers, and, and just a wooden baton. It's, um, you could literally heat up a sword and smack it against a tree or a table and it would probably break at this stage. So I partly answered the question that you didn't need metalworking knowledge necessarily to do this because I was the idiot with the hammer that was able to do this. but Equally, the collaborations that I had with metal workers meant that I understood this process in a completely different way. And I think in the past, you probably would have wanted someone with metal working knowledge to hand because Neil was able to advise and predict where things were going to break um, as a result of where I was hitting them or where they were placed or how hot they were. Uh, there's, since, since I've done these experiments, there's been another set of experiments in Cardiff where Someone's been experimenting with different temperatures and the effects of different temperatures on how these objects break as well. Um, and so going back to this whole sacred versus profane interpretation of deposits at this time, um, I think it, it, I'm less concerned with why this stuff was being done at this stage and more interested in the fact that these, the fragmented objects we see in scrap hoards are being broken in exactly the same way that fragmented objects that are in ritual deposits are also being broken. So it's the same process and then that's being used, but for seemingly completely different purposes. And you might have even had the same people involved in both processes. And I think that's a completely different take on the human agency at this time than what we've, what we've generally seen in the past where it's been assumed that one part of society does one thing and then you have a shaman who's throwing things in a bog on the other side. Um, but on a, on a broader note, um, I kind of just want to flag up that the collaboration with a craftsperson was a completely new experience for me, um, but an incredibly invaluable one for progressing my research. And there was an with any fine space research, obviously, there was the collaboration with museums, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, and other fine specialists. But this was 
another avenue that I think would warrant further exploration in the past. And I still have very good connections with this craft person. I still show him finds and and he reflects on, on what they might be telling us. Um, and it was something completely unpredictable. Uh, I didn't predict when I started this uh, project, but um, it's something that I very much value in having taken away. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to, to talking to you later.